Before we get into it, let's do a quick introduction. An alternate airport on the IFR flight plan is our backup airport, just in case we need to divert there. There are certain legal requirements you must take into account when selecting an alternate airport, such as the ceiling and visibility. When you do take that into account, those are known as the alternate weather minimums. And those minimums actually vary based on the approach at the destination. So you'll see later on in this lesson where, depending if you have a precision approach or a non-precision approach, the minimums required for your alternate are going to be different. Now, when determining an alternate, as long as the TAF forecast for your alternate is at or above the alternate weather minimums, you can continue to use that airport for your alternate. Now, it's very common for people to forget this important point, and that is these alternate weather minimums are for planning purposes only. This is our plan B airport, so we need to make sure it's good, but only before we depart. But once you're in the air and if the ceiling drops below your alternate planning minimums, you don't have to change your alternate. You can continue to use that airport as your alternate as long as the ceilings hold above your landing minimums. And those are actually listed on the approach chart. Another thing we'll talk about before we go into the alternate weather minimums is the concept about usable approach. For example, runway 0927 is considered one usable runway, meaning that if the runway is into wind and it's open because there's no NOTAM that's closed it, that's considered a usable runway. But it's only considered one, even though there's two ends to the runway. Another example is runway 0927, but also runway 0422. As long as both runways are open and they are into wind, they are considered two usable runways. This is a slight detail that's very important when determining your alternate weather minimums. You know, it has to be two physical separate runways to be considered as two runways. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If this is going to be your backup airport and say an aircraft ahead of you maybe had a flat tire, you know, on one of the runways, you don't want your plan B airport to be out the window. You know, at least you have another runway to help you. And the third concept I want to point out before we get into the alternate weather minimums is the concept about height above touchdown zone. Over here, I've listed a chart for the ILS 07 into Ottawa. The number on the left-hand side is the height above sea level. And the number on the right-hand side is the height above the touchdown zone, also referred to as HAT. And you'll see that term a lot coming up. Sometimes people get confused as to which one is the above sea level, which one's the above ground level or ATAT number. And to make it very easy for you, just think about, you know, the lower number is going to be above ground level. And then once you add in the airport elevation, you're going to get the height above sea level. So in this case, you can see the touchdown zone elevation is uh, 373. If you add that to the 200 feet above ground level, that gives you 573. Now 573 becomes your height above sea level. And finally, let's get right into the alternate weather minimums. I would commit these numbers to memory. I'll have a separate lesson on how to actually use this in a real example. But for now, you just have to memorize these numbers. If you have two or more usable precision approaches to two separate runways, remember we talked about that earlier, you must have the weather forecast based on the TAF to be 400 feet AGL and one statute mile, or it must be 200 feet and a half statute mile added to the height above touchdown zone and visibility. So we'll look at an example later on, but there's a little bit of math involved in these type of calculations. The next one is if you have one usable precision approach at that airport, then the minimums are slightly higher. Your TAF must show at least 600 feet AGL and two statute miles, or 300 feet and one mile added to the hat and visibility. Now, if you only have a non-precision approach at that airport, the TAF must show at least 800 feet AGL and two statute miles, or 300 feet and one statute miles added to the ATAT and visibility. And finally, assume that airport, you know, has no IFR approaches available at the alternate. Now, I don't know why you would pick that airport anyways, but let's just say you did because you had no other options. You must ensure that the weather at the destination must be no lower than 500 feet above the minimum IFR altitude. That'll permit you to do a VFR approach and landing. So basically, you will just fly onto the airway, probably get to the sector altitude, and as long as the weather is 500 feet above that airway or the sector, you can then break out of the clouds and then conduct a visual approach and landing. So it gives you some sort of leeway. Now, here's another leeway Transport Canada can give you when determining your alternate weather. Remember, the 602 was for the one usable precision approach. You can then trade your visibility to get a higher ceiling. So you can have a ceiling of 700 feet AGL, but your visibility has to drop to one and a half statute miles. You can have a 800 foot ceiling 
but now the visibility is only one statute mile. So this gives you some flexibility. Or if you fall under the 802 for the non-precision approach, you can use a sliding scale and either have a 900 foot ceiling, but the visibility again drops by half to one and a half statute mile or 1000 foot ceiling and now you only have one mile visibility. So again, these things are designed to give you a little bit more flexibility. Maybe the visibility is not that great at your alternate, but you must ensure you have a higher ceiling. Now, when it comes to calculating these altitudes, you can always round up or round down depending on if you follow the 20 foot rule. So for example, if your height above uh, aerodrome is 621 feet, you have to round up because it's above 20. If it's 420 feet, you round down to 400. And if it's 421, again, you round up to 500. So that's the 20 foot rule. Another thing to consider when you're using the TAF is that you can use the becoming tempo and probability to determine the ceiling at your alternate, but the way you use it is a little different. If the conditions are forecast to improve in the TAF, the forecast becoming condition shall be considered to be applicable as of the end of the becoming period. And these conditions shall not be below the published alternate minimums for the aerodrome. Now, if the conditions are forecast to deteriorate at your alternate, the forecast becoming condition shall be considered to be applicable as of the start of that becoming period. And these conditions also shall not be below the alternate minimums for that aerodrome. You can also use a tempo to determine your alternate. Again, the weather shall not be below the published alternate minimums for that aerodrome. And finally, this might surprise you, you can use a probability, either a prop 30 or a prop 40 condition for determining your alternate. But this time it's a little different. The forecasted weather in the probability shall not be below the landing minimums for that aerodrome, which is the minimums you'll see on your approach chart. Now, all this time I've been talking about using a TAF to determine your alternate weather, but some airports are not serviced by a TAF. In that case, you are allowed to use a GFA, a graphical area forecast, provided that the weather on the GFA shows no lower than 1,000 feet above the lowest HAT or height above aerodrome. There's no cumulonimbus in the forecast and the visibility is not less than three statute miles. It's not a deal breaker if there's no TAF. As long as you have these three for the GFA, you're still good to use it. Now, some airports don't even have traditional nav aids. They have a GNSS or GPS approach. You can use airports based on the GNSS approach only, provided that the pilot verifies that the approach level RAIM or WAS, so Wide Area Augmentation System, and RAIM is Receiver Autonomous Integrated Monitoring System, is expected to be available at the ETA and periodically during the flight, at least once before the midpoint of the flight, the PIC must verify that the approach level RAIM is expected to be available at the planned destination and or alternate, meaning that you have enough satellite coverage. That's basically what it is. And where satellite-based approach is planned at both the destination and alternate, the aerodromes are separated by a minimum of 75 nautical miles if you're within this latitude or 100 nautical miles if you're not located in subsection A. And this is because Transport Canada does not want you to use a GPS-based approach at both your destination and the alternate. But if you are going to use it, it must be separated by 100 nautical miles. And finally, if you do use a GPS for your alternate, the lowest minimums you can use on the chart to determine your alternate weather minimums are LNAV minimums only. You cannot use the LNAV, VNAV or LPV minimums it only has to be LNAV minimums.